All right, welcome to uh, another module uh, for Bio One. Um, so up to up to now, we have covered a large portion of the diversity of of, of living organisms. Um, we've covered two of the, um, or I, I should say, not two, but uh, two and a half of the domains really um, and we're going to finish up the last domain eukaryotes by discussing the evolution of animals uh, we're going to look at how animals have evolved um, throughout earth's history and we're going to break this module up into several different videos the first video is going to focus on kind of the evolutionary history, um, the basic characteristics of, of animals, and then we're each then we're going to have separate videos going over each of the different animal phyla. So we're going to have a video on sponges, on cnidarians, on chordates, which are your vertebrates, etc. And, and so each of those will be broken up because this chapter does contain a lot of information. This is a really detailed, uh, in-depth chapter, much more information than probably any other chapter that we've went over. So make sure you take your time and you go through and you kind of look at all the modules and take notes, um, especially because not only does this chapter have, have a lot of information, but it's also really jargon heavy. There will be a lot of terms that will be associated with um, the all of the different phyla and groups of animals that that we're going to discuss all right so let's jump into it um <clears throat> let me get my screen shared there we go okay <clears throat> okay, sorry about that. We had a little PowerPoint wasn't working right, but now we got it. Okay. So, if we look at the evolution of, of animals, there is a lot that has occurred or, or, or did occur from the earliest animals to um, what we think of as the more kind of recent lineages. Um, or you should say, or I guess you should say like the um, kind of higher evolutionary groups. And that's, that's actually like a bad term, higher and lower. There really shouldn't be like these distinctions on, on different groups because humans aren't, you know, quote unquote, higher up the evolutionary tree versus other organisms. It's just they evolve at different times and at different steps and have different characteristics. But... With that being said, it's, it's hard to like put it into words as to what we mean, right? But if so, if, so if you're looking at an evolutionary tree, the higher, more recent kind of evolutionary groups um, would be humans. And within those evolutionary steps, those evolutionary processes, we can, we can look at our own evolutionary history and we can kind of look at how we have evolved. Um, and for example, if we examine our DNA, we, we, can, we see that a lot of, of human populations actually have Neanderthal DNA within our genomes, meaning that uh, in the, um, on the path to the evolution of humans, Right, we had hybridized with Neanderthal populations, and so that's just kind of one step in that evolutionary process, right? And so, looking at humans, right, we are animals, we are in the animal grouping, we are part of the vertebrate phyla, the chordate phyla, which phylum, which we'll talk about. But if we look at kind of what makes us successful as animals, <clears throat> a lot of it comes from our larger brains. Uh, so our, our brain size relative to our body size. 
Um, so our brain volume to body mass is about 2.5 times the brain volume to body mass of our closest relatives, which are chimpanzees. Um, we also have a really developed portion of the brain that is delegated or, or relegated to um, solving problems and logic and language and kind of like what we think of these intellectual problem solving skills and understandings, right? That is much more developed than what we see in all of the other animals. And what's interesting is that within the, the human evolution, humans have been evolving for, <clears throat> you know, 1.5 million years is what we estimate. Our body size has remained the same, but our, our brain size has increased by about 40%. And if we compare human adaptations to other animals, we can't fly, we can't breathe underwater, we don't produce thousands to millions of offspring. And, and so we're very different in terms of those kind of traits versus all of the other animals and, and humans are just one species out of approximately 1.3 million species of animals that have been named and described and there are many many more species that have yet to be named and described um and so we're just one small piece in this puzzle right but again it's those adaptations that we talked about on this slide right, with our well-developed brain, our um, bipedal walking, our opposed thumbs that really kind of set us apart from uh, all of the other, <clears throat> excuse me, all of the other animal species. And so in order to get to the point at where all of the species evolved the traits that we see those species containing today, that diversity came about over hundreds of millions of years of, of evolution, right? And so that process of natural selection that we talked about during that evolution uh, chapter, where the fit, the most fit traits are the ones that survive and are selected for, and those traits are passed down from generation to generation. And so if you have hundreds of millions of years for this process to happen, then you can get a, a lot of the diversity, all of the diversity that we see today. And so natural selection is really what shaped and has led to the diversity of organisms that, that appear on the landscape today. And we're going to kind of take a quick overview, I say quick relative here, but a quick overview of the major animal phyla. And so if you remember the hierarchical classification of taxonomy that acronym or that um yeah the acronym that i that i told you earlier so dear king philip came over for grape soda now we're looking at the phylum level so deer is domain king is kingdom philip is phylum so we're right underneath the kingdom level and so we're including many different orders and families and genus and or genera and species of, of of animals within these different phylum okay and so it's important to to keep that in perspective whenever we talk about the animal phyla that we're going to be discussing uh, in this in this module now mentioning that animal diversity arose through all of these you know, evolutionary adaptations that occurred over hundreds of millions of years ago, all of those adaptations can coalesce back to one point <clears throat> where the first animal life form, that first animal population existed. And we, we um, hypothesized based off of evidence that animal life began during the pre-Cambrian time period. And it began in the sea, right? It began in the ocean, just like with plants. Okay? And these multicellular creatures ate other organisms, so they're heterotrophic. 
and we define an animal as an organism that has that complex cellular structure, so those eukaryotic cells, they are multicellular, so they're made up of many cells. They cannot make their own sugars for fuel for cellular respiration. They have to eat other organic matter in order to get those carbohydrates and those fats and those proteins. So they are heterotrophic and they are able to digest those foods, that those organic compounds that they consume within their bodies. And unlike plants, animals do not have cell walls that provide support for the body. So animals rely on a lot of other mechanisms for support. If they're in the aquatic environment, they may have a what we call a hydrostatic skeleton that is based off of fluid and the volume of water in the body and it kind of like flows with the with the movement of the currents or it could actually have a cartilaginous skeleton like your shark skates and rays or they could have uh, actual bones and and uh, skeletal elements um, or they could have an exoskeleton so lots of different ways that animals have that structure whereas plants have those cell walls that help to provide support. And also, most animals have muscle cells that allow them to move, and then nerve cells that control the movement of those muscle cells. And so much, much different compared to plants, obviously, uh, when we look at animals. So here we have pretty extreme heterotrophic interaction. Um, where you have a python that is consuming a very large ungulate. I'm not sure if it's a gazelle or like an antelope or a deer of some kind. Um, but yeah, that's pretty amazing um, that there are animals that are capable of, of this type of, of, um, of, of ingestion and food consumption. And so that heterotrophic interaction is the way of, of, animal uh, is the way that animals will generate their their uh, energy from those organic compounds. Now we mentioned that animals are organisms that are eukaryotic, multicellular, and heterotrophic. Most animals are also diploid, meaning that the organism that is on the landscape has two copies of chromosomes in their cells, two copies of each chromosome in their cells. Most animals reproduce sexually and the only cells that are haploid are generally their gametes that they use to reproduce sexually, so the sperm and the eggs, right? And animals will proceed through basic life stages, basic developmental stages that you see in almost all animal forms, all animal life cycles. So for example, a sea star life cycle starts out after fertilization, you'll have a larvae. That larvae will actually undergo a major change in body form. We refer to that as metamorphosis. So you can think of a tadpole metamorphosing into a, a, an adult frog and it becomes then an adult that's capable of reproducing sexually okay so that sexual reproduction can happen so the example of that sea star um, life cycle shown here oops is you have the adult right remember meiosis leads to the development of the egg and sperm and the fertilization happens right that now you are now that egg the fertilized egg is a diploid organism again that diploid egg will then undergo me my, my, mitosis grow and develop until it becomes a larval sea star and then that larval sea star will grow and then metamorphose into an adult so we have this kind of typical life cycle that happens with, with this animal. 
and we see these life cycles in in all animals it's just they differ in terms of development and whether or not they metamorphose and one of the things or one of the common questions that comes about is what exactly did the early animal ancestors look like um what exactly was the first animal population and scientists hypothesize based off of evidence from the most basal animals on the evolutionary tree which are sponges and looking at how organisms would have developed and evolved early on in the aquatic habitats of you know ancient earth we believe that animals evolved from what are known as colonial flagellated protists so basically um, protist cells that live together in a colony and they had flagella that um, allowed them to basically filter feed and um, molecular data points to an origin that is earlier than what we believe is the first origin of animals based off of fossils. So our oldest animal fossils are about 560 million years old, but DNA suggests that that origin point may be a little older. It's just that we don't have any fossils from that time period to actually um, verify that, that hypothesis. Now, this is a hypothetical common ancestor of animals, so the earliest animal, first animal um, organisms. And this, again, is an, it's an artist rendition. So basically, you have a stalk that is attached to some substrate. You have individual protists. So each of these cells are individual protists, okay? But they are they are living together in this colonial type you know this colonial form the flagellum here will beat back and forth causing a water current to move water across these collar cells or, or basically these filters and that will filter out organic material that the protist cell can then take up and use for energy and so these colonial relationships with these early protist cells is what we think may have been the first ancestor to animals. And we, we have fossils from kind of the early Precambrian period. So for example, a sea pen and some um, other fossil species that show us that animals existed during this, this time period. And you can see you know how the um, attachment point is located for this organism and I would expect that this um, feather looking structure here is some sort of filter feeding feathery structure like we see on current um, like sea and enemy uh, two worm species that exist in the deep ocean today and once these early animal ancestors were around, the process of evolution led to this rapid diversification between 535 million to 525 million years ago. So between a time span of 10 million years, we see this explosion of animal diversification and 10 million years in terms of the evolution of, of animals is very, very small, right? That's like a week, right? Or, or a couple of days, if probably even shorter than that, really, in, in terms of geological time. And we refer to this as the Cambrian explosion. And during this Cambrian explosion, this, this massive diversification event, we see almost all of the animal body plans appear new animal phyla appear and lots and lots of different fossils from these groups um, within this 10 million year time span right 
So, so large radiation, large diversification event um, that led to a lot of the body plans that we see today. Now, probably thinking, so, so what led to this rapid diversification? Why did the Cambrian explosion happen? Well, there are, are a couple of, of different hypotheses. One is that scientists think there were these increasingly complex predator-prey relationships that led to kind of these evolutionary arms races that led to kind of key characteristics being selected for in organisms and you know basically that fueling this kind of diversification event also that being combined with increased atmospheric oxygen allows larger body forms to happen and exist and allows for different body plans to, to evolve and be successful. And so we and, and so those are only a couple of the, the hypotheses for, for how or why this explosion event happened. But regardless of, of what led to that rapid diversification, what's interesting out of this is there appears to be a master control framework in terms of our genes that allows for complex body forms to be developed. And what's really interesting with this is scientists have found um, a group of genes that are known as Hox genes, that's H-O-X, and these Hox genes really determine segmentation and body patterns in, in all animals. There are Hox genes in every single organism that you look at. And when you get later on in up in the evolutionary tree of animals, um, you get more Hox genes and more variations of those Hox genes compared to lower in the evolutionary tree where the body plans are more simplistic. And there's like a lot of research looking at these Hox genes and, and, and it's just really interesting how all of this kind of framework was set in place early on and all animals share these genes. It's just how those genes are modified just very sl slightly can determine big changes and result in big changes of these, of these animal body plans. So it's a really interesting um, stuff in terms of, of how genes can, can be responsible for all of these, these different body plans. And so here's what we think based off of fossils, what the, the um, aquatic seascape would have looked like during the Cambrian period. So with like lots of two worms and sponges and jellies and trilobites and ammonites and so all kinds of, of these early forms of, of invertebrate um, species. Okay, so that's it for the first video uh, in the module. We'll come back with the second video where we start actually looking at the animal phylogenies, the animal phylogenetic trees. And then we're gonna go through and we're gonna talk about each of these major phylum uh, in their own video. And so we'll get started with that uh, in the next video.